Hey everyone, it's Mr. Veve, and this lesson is on variation and speciation. So let's get right into it with our first key concept. A population shares a common gene pool, and if gene pools become isolated, new species can form. So let's talk about genetic variation and how it's achieved. So there's two main ways that we can get genetic variation within a population. We can either have mutated genes, or we can have recombined genes. And the way recombination happens, if you remember, is through sexual reproduction and shuffling of those parents' alleles. So you have recombination within the formation of gametes, and then you have random fertilization, which is sexual reproduction. So gene variation uh, is stored in a population's gene pool, which is the, um, the collection of all of the alleles within a certain population. So if you can see here in this one example on the right, we have a big and little b representing the dominant and recessive alleles, and that's just all the alleles present in that uh, population's gene pool. So this brings us to allele frequencies. This has uh, everything to do with how common the alleles are in a population. So how common is the dominant allele? How common is the recessive allele uh, versus the total alleles that are out there? So if you look at this case in the frogs, we have capital and lowercase g. The uh, capital G represents green color, the lowercase g represents brown color, uh, green is dominant to brown, and we have the genotypes of all the different frogs sitting right here. So if we count everything up, we see seven capital G's in the gene pool, and we see five lowercase g's in that gene pool, a total of 12 alleles. So if I ask what was the allele frequency of the capital G, the dominant allele, well there's seven out of 12, that's 58.3%. And that means that the recessive allele, 5 out of 12, has an allele frequency of 41.7%. It's as easy as doing the percentage, part divided by whole. So in genetic terms, evolution occurs when there's a change in that allele frequency in a population. So if you look here, first population had a 70-30% split between allele A and allele B. And then over time, something happened and then the population's uh, allele frequency changed to 60-40. So that's evolution. So natural selection is the main mechanism for evolution, but what we're gonna discuss here are more mechanisms that can change the allele frequency, because that's another uh, aspect of evolution. One of them is gene flow, and that's a change in allele frequency in a population due to the transfer of alleles from one population to another. So just simply transferring alleles from one population to the next. This is usually caused by the migration into or out of a population, best represented by this example of these beetles here. So you have maybe um, a beetle that carries certain alleles, leaves one population and goes into another, thus bringing its alleles into the new population and taking its alleles out of the old population. Another concept is genetic drift, and then this is a change in allele frequency in a population due to a chance or random event. So uh, in this case, you have a random group of beetles from a population, they get stepped on. So what's going to happen is whoever was in that population, whatever alleles were in that population, those are now taken out, and that is a chance encounter there. So a random group um, from a population will colonize a new area, and that example of genetic drift is something called the founder effect. So if you see the group of ladybug looking things over there on the left hand side, uh, they have red and green different colors. Um, perhaps maybe only four of them colonized a new area, but all four were red. Now this is called the founder effect, so you're probably going to see more red ladybugs there uh, than anything else uh, in the first several generations. So the founders of a certain area are not always going to represent the genetic diversity of the original population. Another part of genetic drift is, uh, say you have a random event that kills off most in a population um, and only a random amount survive. So this is actually called a bottleneck effect. So imagine you have a whole bunch of uh, beads, or you have a whole bunch of organisms inside a bottle and you're going to pour only a certain amount out and look, you used to have purple and orange and green beads inside that bottle, and after this random event that killed everything except for a few, you only have purple and a one green that survive. Um, so that, that is something uh, that can occur that is called genetic drift, so bottleneck effect more specifically. 
Now, all of this relates back to genetic equilibrium, and that is a state in which the allele frequency remains constant. That means no evolution is occurring at this time. So now we're going to move on to a second key concept here about speciation, which is the process of forming a new species. Again, speciation, forming a new species, and that is usually when you have populations that are isolated from one another and they cannot interbreed, which means their gene pools cannot mix. Thus, over time, this forms a new species. Now, there are certain uh, factors that can create this, what we call reproductive isolation, which is when members of different populations can no longer mate successfully. And we're gonna discuss three different types of reproductive isolation, which can cause the formation of new species. The first is behavioral isolation. So this is when species are isolated from each other because maybe they have different mating rituals or something like that. They have different behaviors that prevent them from wanting to mate with one another. So that is behavioral isolation. Now we have temporal isolation. Now that is maybe when the species do not mate with one another because they usually mate at different times of the year or different times of day. Uh, as shown in this graph here, a wood frog versus a leopard frog, they have a peak in their mating activity at different times of the year, so they're never going to really mate with one another because they are temporally isolated. And the final type of isolation is called geographic isolation, and that is as simple as the species are isolated from each other geographically. They cannot get to one another. Usually there's a, a large amount of land between them, maybe a river between them, a mountain range, uh, on the right hand side, these two different chipmunk like creatures are separated by the Grand Canyon. They cannot get to each other. So that is an example of geographic isolation.